Ancient quarries exist in many places on Earth. One of the largest is the Western Bare in Cambodia. Now it's a reservoir, but mostly these are quarries or ancient Roman quarries. Official history does not acknowledge ancient or massive excavations in regions without densely populated urban cultures. No such cases are recorded. In a post from one of the groups dedicated to alternative history, the coordinates of the place are shown. This is just north of the Yenisei River in Tuva. It may seem ordinary, a mountain ridge simply turns even by 90 degrees. A natural quirk, nothing unusual. But to the northwest, another rectangular area can be seen. It seems as if the mountains were cut by something, as if there were excavations, as if they were of interest to someone at some point. Let's check this place on the map. The size of the excavation is 14 by 12 kilometers, and the size of the rectangular appendix is 3 by 2.8 kilometers. By geophysicist Nikolai Andreev, who owns a proprietary technology for remote sensing using satellite images, more than one such ore body or water source has been found and later confirmed. It turns out he already knows about this place and described it as follows. The blue lines outline the centers of deep fluid intrusions, which form several deposits here. Hydrocarbon deposits are marked with purple lines. The outlines of ore bodies are indicated with orange lines. The contours of alluvial places and primary gold placer trails are shown with golden lines. Only one deposit is shown here in detail. All the other centers have exactly the same set of elements. Here, within the cleared area, including the appendix in the northwest corner, there is a group of five large sulfide ore deposits. The clearing of this area was carried out at the end of the 15th century, but some global cataclysm that occurred at that time prevented the completion of this grand project for us, which for that ancient civilization that perished back then was just a routine matter. If you don't dwell on the scale of the processed rock and just accept this information, then who could have carried out such gigantic excavations? Who lived here? Well, probably the inhabitants of Tartaria would say someone familiar with alternative history topics. But even in modern history, there are many peoples, the Scythians, their descendants, the Andronovo, Afanasievo, Tashtik, and other cultures. Artifacts from them remain, and you can see them in local museums in the south of Siberia. The Valley of the Kings in Tuva has hundreds of excavated, looted, and untouched burial mounds. Excavations continue in some areas, with most occurring in the 19th and 20th centuries, in the Arzan II burial mound alone, 20 kilograms of gold jewelry, 9,300 gold coins and a huge number of gold beads were found. Part of the jewelry is in the Tuva Museum in Kezil, and the other part is in the Hermitage. So the question is, how could the nomads, according to historians, engage in such large-scale ore processing and extensive gold mining? Look at their level of craftsmanship and their jewelry. It's on par with modern ones. We're often told that past cultures and civilizations lacked technology. Maybe some of their technology was handmade, like in our villages, but you can't call them backward. It's no surprise that the Scythians knew about such a basic device as a pump. And then the mountains could be washed away using a device that we call a hydraulic monitor. The Yenisei River is close, just pump and send it to the mountains. If the mountains were still young, with some rocks not yet compacted or hardened, they could be washed away in large volumes. The ancient Romans knew this technology, but historians say they used lake water from the hills. And this Roman gold-bearing quarry called Las Medulas is located in Spain. It also matches the scale of hydraulic monitor work. Obviously, the Scythians were far from being just nomads, or not only nomads. Apparently, they were residents of one of the provinces, the so-called Tartari. And judging by the amount of bronze items found, specifically axes, they were skilled metallurgists, not just jewelers. Someone sent a link to an interesting discovery made by an observant person who knows how to ask the right questions. For decades, locals have observed this mysterious artifact, but no one asks what it is. Details from the Discover 
Yesterday, I walked my dog in new places. Specifically, the site of a small mine abandoned since the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics is collapse. And near the mine building, there are stone piles like this lying all around. The diameter is at least 2 meters and the material isn't concrete, it appears to be sandstone. Some of the stones have a smaller top part covered with various types of teeth like gears. Other shafts have a groove like a spool where you can also see wavy teeth with strange patterns. The stones were clearly created not even during Soviet times but even earlier. Natural origin, I rule it out. How old could they be? How were they made? Who made them? And for what purpose were they created? What kind of tool in theory is even capable of working stone like that? How did they arrive at this clearing and what might have transported them? The main idea is that these stone discs are old millstone blanks from a long gone local water mill stacked together. Something kept them from becoming finished products. Or is it a stone wheel for a cart used when threshing the harvest laid out in a circle like this one? It seems logical, but the stone's layered structure gives them away as the monolith quickly broke along the soft veins. It could have happened after a short time at work and the disc would have fallen apart. Another assumption. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were definitely two large steam mills and other industries here, including the production of burnt lime, which had to be crushed by something before firing. This is also confirmed by historical descriptions of this place and the scale of infrastructure during early 20th century coal mining. Rudnik, president of the Franco-Russian Society. But if we take a closer look at these disc-shaped stones, We'll see what kind of decorative cap with some ornament is next to the stone discs. And why is it that inside one segment among these layers is not broken and has smooth cylindrical shapes but of a smaller diameter. They also show traces from something with a clear sequence, like a gear indicating they were intentionally made. But why? Perhaps these really were some kind of gears to give more friction to the drive belts on the mills so they wouldn't slip. And the large diameter stones are for increasing the angular velocity of the whole structure. Metal was expensive, so resourceful mill owners most likely used these stones instead of metal. Their inertia also helped smooth out the loads on the steam engines or water drive when large or hard pieces of lime got into the mill. Cheap and efficient. There's no need for a 3 to 5 fold power reserve for the steam engine or the river current. But then how was this stone cylinder cut out? Why is it clearly made from a single piece of rock but not granite? A granite boulder? It still needs to be delivered and processed for a long time. They were probably used for the working part of the mill. A commenter suggested that if there are coal mines here, they must have drilled to reach the seams and built shafts for miners to descend and lift coal. Mines also need ventilation shafts in seams with a lot of methane and other explosive gases. They drilled with equipment that resembled modern diamond drilling, using core bits that produced a core sample, only much larger in size. Someone wrote on Wikipedia that it was core samples with a diameter of 3 meters that remained from the 1960s. These are cores from the construction of a ventilation shaft. If you look for photos of abandoned coal mines in these areas of Donbass, you can find an example. Concrete rings are installed in the shaft and covered with some kind of plaster, probably cement-based waterproofing. There are still such things nowadays. Here's another observation. You can see that the stone is plastered with some kind of red compound, geopolymer granite, for greater wear resistance. This was so the belts wouldn't wear out so quickly, these huge flywheels and primitive pulleys. But that's just one theory. So, we come to a conclusion. Either this is a recipe for artificial stone, which was already known back in the 1960s, or they are much older. And the irregular shape of the large flywheel suggests that they were only needed for inertia. Imbalance at low speeds has little effect and won't cause shaft vibration. So, the preliminary conclusion is this. They drilled the wellbore. This was at the beginning of the 20th century. And Kern was used for the mill mechanisms as a flywheel increasing rotation through a belt drive with huge inertia for which a powerful drive wasn't needed.
And here, for example, are modern large diameter core drills. Technologically, such drills could have been made at the beginning of the 20th century. A disc made of strong metal, drills around the perimeter, and a drive powered by a steam engine, with lifting done by a winch also powered by a steam engine. In the material traces of mining equipment on the walls of an ancient high mountain quarry in Japan, strange marks were shown on the walls of an ancient quarry on the Boso Peninsula in Japan. They are identical to the marks on the walls in the caves and grottos of Langyu in China, which are also man-made. The marks look similar to those left by modern mining equipment, for example in salt mining shafts. Let's take a look at two more quarries in Japan that even the locals don't know about and think about what kind of tool or equipment could have left such marks in the stone. Both quarries are in southern Izu Peninsula. The first is the underground fortress or quarry Maruyama. What immediately catches the eye are the multi-level excavations with strange stripe-like marks, inside of which you can see grooves in a herringbone pattern. There are analogies. Similar marks can be seen in modern underground salt mines, where the grooves and stripes are left by mining equipment, but the same traces can also be seen in the narrow passages of the quarry. How did the equipment work in such conditions? Was it small and compact or even handheld? The stripes on the walls have a specific radius. When extracting stone by hand with primitive tools, there's no reason or way to leave such evenly spaced stripes. Modern mining equipment for salt extraction crushes the rock into gravel and stones. If the same was done in this quarry in the past, then why would they need gravel, especially when extracting it in this way? And couldn't they find a mountainside closer to the city? Why did they have to go inside the mountain right here? Large rocks block part of the excavation. There is information that quarrying in the Kamenolomnia was carried out in the 18th and 19th centuries and even up to the middle of the 20th century. The piled up remains resemble a blockage seemingly made to stop people from going further into the excavations. It is assumed stone was not quarried here. Instead, a plastic material was extracted to form palace wall blocks. The material hardened from carbon dioxide in the air, but slowly. This effect is present even in modern concretes based on Portland cement. The ancients knew that a mountain is a squeezed out plastic mass from the earth during a tectonic catastrophe. Its surface had hardened and formed a shell, but inside there were still plastic materials. Maybe just a little loose, like dried clay. They likely extracted this material as a mass and small stones, then tamped it into molds or directly into formwork or masonry, as seen in Peru's polygonal masonry. The blocks would harden into stone, and there's no other way to explain the transformation of rock into rubble, because mining equipment crushes the rock, not cuts out blocks. There are no rectangular marks from cutting out blocks on the walls and vaults of the quarry, but there's another quarry on the Izu Peninsula, located near the Yumigahama beaches. And here we see the same thing. This is the principle of extracting rock with a narrow passage leading to the quarry itself. The same marks and grooves on the walls. At first you might think it's the same object, but then, after looking at the photos, you find differences. Before any travel restrictions, the Japanese were one of the most well-traveled nations. However, as we can see, their country has places that are just as interesting as the well-known landmarks. They would be worth exploring, even at an amateur level.